The gnashing of teeth is as furious now in Ontario as it was three years ago when the province rolled out its updated sex ed curriculum. Ontario's health and physical education curriculum was released in 2015 to a storm of criticism from social conservatives, new Canadians, and religious groups. Forget the fact the curriculum hadn't been updated in almost 20 years when it was brought in. So much changed between 1998 and 2015. The smartphone, sexting, online bullying, all in the future. Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe for Unpublished Ottawa. I'm Ed Hand. The Ontario election is less than two weeks away, and an issue that was in the rearview mirror is once again closer than the image appears. Ontario PC leader Doug Ford is trying to appease the social conservatives in the party that, if he wins the election, he'll repeal the curriculum and ask for more parent consultation. But after almost three years, what happens to those young students who've received a bit of that curriculum, but then the tap is shut off? It's one of the questions we'll try and resolve on the Unpublished Cafe. Well, Doug Ford says he wants to repeal it. The New Democrats, the Liberals, and the Green Party all say they'll leave it alone. I had reached out to Tanya Granick-Allen, who ran for the PC leadership primarily to remove the curriculum for her views, but after initial contact, she's disappeared. The Ontario Party is brand new to the political landscape for this election. It was formerly known as the Ontario Alliance Party. Jay Tissick is the interim leader, and he joins us to discuss. How are you, Jay? Doing well, Ed. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Now, where is the Ontario Party on the sex ed curriculum? Full repeal. And why? We we would scrap it. Well, uh, I mean, set aside that it's uh, really just a, a bunch of social engineering, which I don't think is the business of government. It's uh, it, it never had any consultation. I mean, we're a society of, you know, the governed are uh, like the governors govern with consent of the governed. Right. So without them having given consent to this package and them being the parents, how can they bring it in and just say, deal with it? I mean, I was actually active against that file back in 2015. And um, at the time, we really didn't know what was in it. So I I found it kind of, I don't know, strange, all the the name calling that was going on whenever anyone opposed it, when all parents were asking for was to be able to see it before it was implemented. And they were called names for that. All right. Well, let's let's, uh, let's, let's talk about public consultation. 4,000 parents across the province were uh, consulted on this. Do you know how that consultation went down? Yeah. They were handpicked, and they were all from parent councils. They had to sign non-disclosure agreements before they were allowed to read it. And uh, the questions were things like, do you think we should make school safer for our children? Do you think children should be made to feel more inclusive? There was no specific questions about what was being introduced. It was all, I guess, a bit of just Delphi technique to get the answers they wanted. I mean, you write questions like that. What parent is going to say, no, I don't want students to feel included? Obviously, every parent wants kids to be included. All right. Well, now you mentioned social engineering. How do you see this curriculum as social engineering? Well, when the government imposes something on the people without them asking for it, they've obviously made decisions they'd like to move the society in a certain way. And that kind of top-down decision-making about societal values and morals is social engineering by definition. I mean, this isn't something that the people were demanding. You know, government exists to serve the people, not to make decisions about what they want the people to think, feel, believe, and how they want them to act, and then to impose those things upon them. That's why I think it's social engineering, which, I mean, it'd be hard to argue wasn't. Would you say it's safe to say that your party rose from the Ontario PCs wavering on this uh, the, the sex ed curriculum? As I recall, wasn't Patrick Brown not going to repeal it or even talk about it anymore? Patrick Brown did flip flop on it a number of times. He was for it. He was against it. He was for it. He was against it. Um, but I, that was one issue I think that we had. And uh, I do want to correct your intro, if I may. You were saying that uh, social conservatives were upset and certain groups uh, alongside that. No, no, it was parents. Parents were upset. But um, back to Patrick Brown. No, our party came about uh, simply because of the undemocratic methods. I mean, it's, again, the same thing. A government that starts imposing upon its people things that they're not asking for and then forcing them to comply, that is not democracy. That is not the way our society runs. Patrick started doing the same thing with the nominations, and it so happens that he was abusing the nomination vetting process to weed out people who had opinions on this particular issue, among other things. Um, We were really, this has always been about democracy, about 
people being able to determine their own future. And I mean, in this case, we're talking about our children. I mean, parents are being denied the right to even have input on what their children learn and when, especially on complex topics where there are very divided views. And let's be honest, we we live in a diverse culture and society, and that's a fantastic thing. But we need to respect that diversity. I mean, when they say that some parents, you know, like you said, the religious right, it's not just things they think. These are deeply held beliefs that shape the core of their identity. And when you tell them that you're going to teach their kids that their parents are actually bad people, that they're bigots, that's offensive. And that is not the role of government. So, yeah, there was a problem with that specific issue, but there's also a a real problem with government thinking it has the right to dictate down to people what they want society to look like and expect people to just fall in line or else. Jay Tissick is uh, the interim leader of the Ontario Party, and he's joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. As we talk about the Ontario sex ed curriculum, which is once again back in the uh, election campaign. And when we talk about this, and it, it seems some parents, they don't like the information. Some do. And, and I think you're forgetting there's a lot of parents who do appreciate the, the curriculum. They seem to be being left out from your point of view here. Well, let's ask them. Let's put it to a referendum. Let's go back to that consultation that we're talking about, if that's true. And I mean, that's one of the things that I thought was funny about their implementation. They convinced, they told us it was so good, even though we weren't allowed to see it. No, no, it's very good. And if you don't like it, you must be a horrible person. Well, if it is so good, then use it as a teaching moment for not just the students, but the parents. If they really believed it was that good and that people would accept it if they understood it, why didn't, instead of them insulting the parents, calling them names, and they called them some horrible names, let's be honest. I mean, Well, let's uh, face it, the other side got names, horrible names called as well. Both sides. Well, none that I'm aware of, but, oh, I but back know. to the point. Anyway, why wouldn't they just say to the parents, okay, look, we understand this is, this is a lot of change that we're asking you to accept, but we'd like to sit down with you and explain it, hear your thoughts, tell you the values, bring in experts to meet with you. No, they just said this is happening, and if you don't like it, you're a bad person. That, it, that's not how you implement things that are good for people. Do you not see information as power? I also see bad information as dangerous. Well, we're, we're because just... it is powerful. All information is powerful, and if that information is is bad, then it, then it can be powerfully dangerous. And what information do you see as being bad here? I'm, I'm not even talking about the curriculum specifically. I do think there are issues. I mean. To, t- to think that children who still believe in Santa Claus should be learning about anal sex, I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Oh, come on, that's that not even, absurd. you know that's not true, and that's not in the curriculum. And it certainly isn't those At what age do they kids. start then? At what age do they start? Well, that's a health issue. W- that's what they At were what talking about. what age do they about. start learning about anal sex? Then tell me. If I recall, it was grade 7. Okay, grade 7, so 12 years old. they just stopped believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now let, let's go back to your. Let's go back to the uh, the Ontario Party. I was checking out your website, uh, and you mm-hmm. say no to the sex ed curriculum. Let, let parents decide with choice and competition on schooling. Tell yeah. me about this choice and competition. Okay. Um, there's a lot we could talk about here. For starters, uh, I think we've come to the point where the Ministry of Education has become a failed and bloated bureaucracy that's not functioning. Our children are not being served well by the education system we have. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, the Fraser reports demonstrated more than half of our kids couldn't pass a math test. And I think because they're being taught the wrong things. See, the problem with the Ministry of Education is when you consolidate power, it attracts people who seek to abuse or use that power for their own agendas. And I think that's what we've had happen here. I've seen some curriculum that have come out of that place that is just absurd. Three-day courses on math where they they spend the whole thing reading a book and then talking about ways to make up for residential schools and stuff. There's no math teaching, but it's a math class. Why are they using that time that way? Because someone who wanted that issue to be brought up stuck it into a curriculum where it didn't belong. I mean, math should be for math, reading for reading. I think we should be teaching kids basic education. So back to the ministry. It's gone awry, and you can't take a system like this that expects to feed every child in the province in one side and come out with a sameness on the other side. People aren't the same and you can't treat them like you're going to make them the same because you can't, 
if you got a well, we talked about this before, actually, you and I uh, on the last time I was on. Mm. If you got a child that's more advanced and a child that needs extra help, well, you can't bring the one that needs extra help up to that higher level. All you can do, if you want that sameness of income, is push that at one that's excelling down. So it, it's a bad system. Now, our original Education Act, the way it was written, the school boards had the power of setting curriculum, hiring teachers, all that stuff, and they were responsible directly to the parents. Those school board trustees were elected by the parents. It wasn't some bureaucracy in Toronto that just dictated to the whole province. You could meet your school board trustee and talk to them if you had concerns, and they had to live in the community with the people that they were teaching, whose kids they were teaching. I mean, it, it creates a a different relationship with the school system, and they, they tax directly, which is important. They would tax directly, so by controlling the money, they made the decisions, and no one could tell them otherwise. Now, the Ministry of Education has decided it's going to suck up all the money there and then dole it out as it sees fit. I mean, our local school board now has become basically a glorified condo board. It takes care of the bricks and mortar of the building and little else. It doesn't have any say about what goes on inside. So we need to restore that local representation that we lost through this Ministry of Education. Just do away with it. And you know what? We should offer more choice in schools. And how I do think you do there that? There are a lot of systems. You want to well, there's it. a lot of systems that work. New Zealand runs its entire thing on charter schools and a voucher system. Very functional. Very good. Parents can choose. You'd see lots of schools spring up to cater to lots of different students. You'd have art schools. You'd have sports schools. You'd have That's pretty uh, expensive, academic though, right? schools. That's pretty expensive, right? Well, for the parents. No, no, not at all, because it, it's the same that they're paying now, except they don't pay to the Ministry of Education. The money goes directly to the school of their choice. And then the ones that are good will succeed. The ones that aren't good will fail. And that's that's free market. And you'd see yeah, but that doesn't really help doing those, better and well, trying on, harder to attract those free, parents. Free market doesn't necessarily help those students to get left behind because they they you know because they're in a free market yet they were terrible at it. You've, you, what you've done is you've set up these 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 kids in a in a well, no, you'd situation. Have every neighborhood with tons of schools. You'd have lots and lots of little schools running privately and efficiently, and they would set their own curriculum and hire their own teachers, and parents would decide which one they wanted their kid to go to, and. The truth is, okay, you're saying that the free market can't handle it because it's so important we don't believe in kids alone. But I like to use this example. Imagine if the government decided that food distribution was far too important to leave to the free market because what if some people in one area didn't get enough food? So they, they nationalize the grocery store business. And so now they say to you, you're going to be assigned a grocery store based on your address. That's the only grocery store you're allowed to shop at. When you walk in, it's not like there's shelves and you go walking around and pick what you want and then pay on the way out. You're handed a bag when you walk in and what's in that bag is yours. It's been predetermined for you based on what they believe the needs of your family to be. Now you take that bag and you leave and you go home and then you start going through it and you go, I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't want this. And you end up with a lot of stuff you don't want or need and maybe not enough to actually get by because you had no say in what you're getting. Right. And who decides then what's in your bag? If not you, well, lobbyists going to the minister's office and saying, use our products like Coke and Nestle would be in there all the time. And that's how they decide what you're going to get in your bag. And then you just get it. We would never accept that in a grocery store ever. So why would we accept that as a system by which we educate our children? It's, it's ludicrous to me. Jay, how, how much do you feel this, this issue, you know, the resurrection of this sex ed curriculum is going to define this election? I don't know if it's going to define the election, but it's going, to, it's going to sway a lot of votes. There's a lot of people that are still upset. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, my position is not that this curriculum is necessarily bad. My position is that government doesn't have the right to tackle those issues in the way that they did, period. And I'll point this out by saying uh, we know governments change. So what if tomorrow, let's say the Pope were elected premier, right? And he appointed all his bishops as ministers, so the bishop minister of education decides only Christian teaching is going to be allowed in school. I'd still be saying, you don't have that right government. That's it. You know, and now you'd be on the other side of the argument going, you'd be now you're saying they have the right because you agree with what they want to do, but you'd be saying, oh wait, no, stop, you don't have that right. You either have it all the time or you have it none of the time, and I, I prefer to not give it to them any of the time. That's just me. I think parents should be deciding what's right for the kids because we love our children bureaucrats in Toronto 
most of them with an agenda don't love our children. They love their agenda. What's and the, I, I okay? What you, you, you brought up the agenda a number of times? What agenda are you talking about? Specifically, whatever agenda, what agenda they might have. Well, come on. There, if you're going to say there's okay, an agenda, well, that's pretty case, broad. In the case of education, Marxism is what I believe the agenda is. I believe it's Marxism, and I think they're going after the foundations of our society to undermine it so they can make fundamental changes. That's why I say it's social engineering. I think a lot of very Marxist and communist ideologically aligned people gravitate towards the Ministry of Education and to organizations like OISE because they see it as an opportunity to start exactly what I've said, social engineering. That's the agenda I'm talking about. All right. So I prefer a free society. Jay, uh, I want and to I thank... I prefer free thinkers. Uh, okay, that's cool. Jay, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining right. us, and I wish you all the best uh, on the rest of the election campaign. Jay Tissick is the interim leader of the newly minted Ontario Party, formerly the Ontario Alliance. For some people watching the outrage against the Ontario health and physical education curriculum, it appears the anger is tinged a bit with religion. Kirk Moss is a social sciences teacher with the Toronto District School Board. He's a mentor, coach, curriculum writer, and a journalist who works extensively in the field of equity, diversity, and anti-oppressive social and educational practices. And he joins us on the Unpublished Cafe. And Kirk... As a teacher, before the curriculum came in, the new sex ed curriculum, what shortfalls, if any, were you seeing in what students were being taught? First of all, thank you very much for having me on the show, and thank you for that introduction. I think that this is a very important issue to discuss, but it's also important because we find in ourselves having to revamp these discussions almost at every political interim. And so I think it's really important that we try to have these discussions in a way that can really make it very clear and also to make it very transparent in regards to how does education as an institution and as a system play a critical role in educating properly and educating very, very thoroughly for the best interests of our young people and to make sure that they are being taught in a way that's going to motivate, empower, encourage, but also make them overcome and be more comfortable with certain fears and notions around either issues of sexuality or issues around sex and biology. And also, I think that the phys ed and kinesiology and health education wasn't necessarily going as far in regards to what needed to be taught properly. And I think this new curriculum really elevates things to another level in regards to how students can be more properly informed can be educated in a more timely manner, especially in an environment now where we have things like Ashley Madison, Tinder, and Instagram, and social media as being a real strong force in guiding our students' ways of learning and also ways of thinking about issues like sex and a plethora of other issues as well. You know, if the, the Ontario uh, Health, and educa- Health Education um, Curriculum or physical education curriculum, when, when, you, when you look at it, only about 10% of it really deals with the, uh, with, with the sex ed part. The rest is more primarily about edu- uh, the health and, and physical fitness, is it not? Exactly. And so the reality is that we're focusing all our energy, I would say 90% of our energy is focused on 10% of a curriculum document, which in many ways is somewhat a waste of time. I think what's really critical here is how is it that 10% can get people's attention so dramatically, number one, but also when you look at overall health and well-being, what we're trying to do right now, especially as educators, is to focus on the overall picture of what students need to learn. And at this time in our history and in our society, we are emphasizing that mental health and well-being is crucial and having an active lifestyle is critical and imperative towards students really feeling that they are being educated in a well-rounded manner, in a manner that's going to not only reach the academic, let's say the math and science part of their lives, but also about the other aspects of who they are as a person and as a citizen in our society and mental health specifically. When we did research, let's say around seven years ago, looking at the mental health picture of our student body, we realized that the student population was really behind in regards to either their awareness 
or they're understanding the mental health. And when we did our research at that point, we realized that one in five students was suffering from some kind of mental health challenge and mental health difficulty. Now that number has changed. And we haven't, I haven't seen the research numbers recently, but we've realized that we need to do more acute uh, investigations into what kind of curriculum, what kind of teaching strategies, and what kind of overall educational vision do we need that will embody the mental health and wellness of students as well as their active lifestyles and what it means for them to have healthy lives uh, when it comes to their academic work, but also when it comes to their physical health and well-being. Kirk Moss is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe, a social sciences teacher with the Toronto District School Board, as well as a curriculum writer and a journalist who works extensively in the field of equity, diversity, and anti-oppressive social and educational practices. Now, you wrote an interesting commentary about the backlash against the uh, curriculum that took aim at Kathleen Wynne's sexual orientation. Now, do you feel the religious objections to the curriculum are because of that? I think that it's really important that as an educator... I treat students, parents, and the community at large in a manner that is equitable and that is fair. And I think that religious diversity is extremely important because when it comes to our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we look at how religion and religious rights are protected, how freedom of association and freedom of assembly is also granted. And it's important that as educators, we respect those rights of our parents and of our diverse communities. And so I think that has to be front and center in regards to this kind of conversation. For myself, I've taught religion in the school system and I've thoroughly enjoyed teaching religion and being a person who respects the diverse plethora of religious practices that are in our schools. Right now our students are celebrating and are practicing Ramadan. And so it's important that we're able to recognize and respect that particular tradition and various others such as Chinese New Year or others around Taoism, around Buddhism, as well as around Judaism and Christianity. And so for me, it's important to respect those different belief systems and how integral of a role they play in the lives of everyday citizens and also in the lives of our students. When it comes to Kathleen Wynne more specifically, I think that there has always been this backroom conversation about sexuality. And ever since Kathleen Wynne made it very clear, that she's an empowered woman, a woman who believes in occupying a space of power, and one who is also very proud of her sexuality, I think that people, some people, not all people, some people became uncomfortable. Unfortunately, it is that small voice of opposition that has gotten some kind of amplified voice within the public sphere, and also attention that I think perhaps was not necessary. I think what needed to happen was a conversation about issues around sexuality and people's uncomfortableness around her specific sexuality and why that made people uncomfortable in 2018. And I think it's unfortunate. Perhaps this is public awareness. Perhaps it is education. Perhaps it is public education. I don't know where the conversation needs to happen. But I think there needs to be a conversation around adult responsibility in regards to accepting and embracing differences in a way that is inclusive. And I think that as adults, the expectation is on us to be aware enough to know how to treat people who are different from ourselves, whether we're heterosexual, whether we are male, whether we are in positions of power, how to treat those that are different from us in a respectable manner, in a responsible way in a way that is mature. We as parents and also as educators are setting an example for our students and for our young people of tomorrow. And the future belongs to them. So how we prepare them for the present will be much of a shouldered responsibility that we need to take wholeheartedly and that we need to take proper focus on in regards to how they will treat each other. And so for us to treat a public figure with disdain because of their sexuality, is one, unacceptable, two, disrespectful, and three, very unprofessional. And I think that we need to show much more maturity around how we talk about public figures and attacking their sexuality is one that shows a lack of class 
on anyone's part to do that. Now, you've mentioned respect a number of times here, but it seems the side that is against the curriculum doesn't seem to have a lot of respect for the views of the parents who do embrace it. No, and I I find it to be unfortunate because that is the vast majority of parents. It is quite a large number of parents who've been consulted time and again. There were several levels and layers of consultations across the province that took place in order to hear the voices of parents and community members and various stakeholders about where they stood on these issues. And they had the opportunity of voicing their concerns, a voice in their opposition, and have also voiced in their sense of contentness and comfort with the direction that this curriculum was taken. And so all that information was taken into account as this curriculum document was being tailored and was also being written. And so I want to make it very clear that the extensive consultation that took place was able to grapple with the oppositional voices, but was also able to take into account the vast majority of parents that said, listen, these conversations, one, are not taking place at dinner tables. It is a fantasy that we've lived with ever since the dawn of the 1900s that parents know best and that parents were having these great conversations with children about sex education. The reality is that was not taking place on a large scale. As well, many parents were not taught themselves how to understand these very uncomfortable conversations or uncomfortable topics. How are they now to have conversations with students or with their child about these issues when they themselves have not been taught how to properly understand these issues, how to embrace them, and how to be comfortable with them? And so I think that's a lot to expect from parents who are not properly taught or trained how to do that themselves. And I think then it becomes this fulfilling myth that, yes, parents are doing it because of some miraculous survey or questionnaires that have taken place in our minds about this taking place. And so the reality is, yes, from when I was in high school, maybe you were in high school, there has been a drop in teenage pregnancy. Has that been because of education taking place at home? Maybe. Is it a combination of perhaps better teaching in regards to sex education? Possibly. But we also cannot forget that with different forms of birth control has also come a drop in pregnancies overall. There's also been a decline in teenage pregnancies for all those other factors involved. And so I think that it's important that it's not just pregnancy that has to be at the forefront of this conversation. We also have to look at the overall idea of sexual education outside of just the idea of sex. There has to be other ideas around body image, around the idea of embracing diversity in terms of sexuality. And I think it's important to look at those different issues that spawn the sex curriculum itself. Kirk, uh, as an educator, I I wonder, are are there any concerns for you uh, for the students if this curriculum is repealed? Oh, I think it's quite terrifying. I think that it is very dreadful to ever contemplate withdrawing this kind of curriculum. Look at what's happening right now with NAFTA and these kind of talks about having trade barriers and tariffs being increased and cross-border travel as well as cross-border trading being limited. Imagine the traumatic impact that will have on our overall economy and cross-border relations. I think that if you look at climate change and the opportunity we had at Paris Accord or even with Kyoto and seeing how devastating those policies not being implemented properly by different countries and nations across the world has had on our own environments, whether it be dramatic and, tr- and also very violent storms that we're having when it comes to climate change. And I think this can be looked at in terms of what this will have on the psychological, on the emotional, and also on the overall awareness of students and young people to properly be educated about what it means to be a person who has a body that they are in control of, about a body that they own and that this belongs to them and them only, and that they have the right to whoever they choose to share their body or share their emotional well-being with, and also who to invite into their personal spaces 
to be a part of their lives. And having students being empowered to really take control of themselves, taking control of their own identity, and also being empowered to understand them, their biological functions and also their sense of sexuality and sexual um, identity is so critical. And especially at this time and era where we have social media becoming a platform where all kinds of information is being shared. And some of that information is not always accurate. Mm -hmm. It's not always healthy. And it's not always in the best interest of our students and our young people. I think it's so important that we are able to clear the fog of social media and get beyond those screens of communication and have some real productive dialogue that can help young people to be properly informed and to have them being educated in their own best self-interest in a way that's going to make them more healthier. That's going to help them to make better decisions about issues around sex and sexuality. And it's going to help them become empowered adults in the future around these kind of issues. Kirk, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Kirk Moss is a social sciences teacher with the Toronto District School Board, as well as a curriculum writer and a journalist who works in the field of equity, diversity, and anti-oppressive social and educational practice. Now, parents who were dead set against Ontario sex ed curriculum maintain their oppositions because they feel it runs counter to their beliefs. They'll say they know what's best for their children. But do they? Some will see such actions as detrimental to their kids' health by denying them the knowledge they'll need in today's world. Danielle McLaughlin was the Director of Education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Education Trust from 1988 to 2016. As well, she's a blogger with the Centre of Free Expression at Ryerson University, and she joins us on the Unpublished Cafe. Danielle, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Opponents to the curriculum will say it sexualizes children, but you don't see it that way, do you? No. Um, I, in, in fact, there's evidence that, that children who have good information uh, about their bodies and about uh, sex in general are less likely to be sexually active at a younger age. Um, so I, I think it really uh, provides children with the necessary information and education. I think there's a lot of uh, false information out there about what the Ontario curriculum uh, c- contains. The, the, the physical health and education curriculum uh, in general, only 10% of that has to do with sex education. So it's it's not like it's, you know, we're we're all going to sit down for the next three weeks and talk about sex. It's it's part of, uh, you know, learning about who's in a family. It's part of uh, learning, you know, how our bodies work. It's part of learning about, you know, what it means to live in in a society and and what it means to have agency as a a human. I can't imagine that there are people who don't want their children to have the knowledge that they need to protect themselves if necessary and also, you know, to become um, free and independent humans. So, you know, I, I, I understand the the complaints. I actually, um, a, a year or so ago, I guess two years ago now, uh, decided to go to one of the protests that was being held against the sex education curriculum so that I could just ask the people attending what it was that they didn't want to to have their children learn, um, you know, because I, I was confused myself. I, I, I've read the sex education curriculum. It's pretty clear to me most of the people objecting have not done that. Um, but, you know, people people feel that the parents are the children's best educators. Well, that's, that's not wrong. Um, you know, parents are indeed... The parent, the you know, the, the first and, and, and often the best, but parents don't know everything, and um, that's why we send our kids to school at all. And I think that there are things that our kids need to to know and to learn about that parents may either not know or may be uncomfortable discussing with their with their children. So um, you know. I, I really, I, I understand people saying, well, you know, in, in our culture, there are only two sexes, you know, and there's no such thing as homosexuality in our culture, uh, or people who, who say, you know, 
I'm sorry, they, this is this is not appropriate. I don't want my child to learn about um, uh, you know sex, sexual act. But again, they haven't read the curriculum to, to learn what it is that will be taught at the ages and, and when it will be taught. A lot of people are saying, well, you know, it's just age inappropriate. But if you actually look at the topics by grade, you'll see it's really not age inappropriate. For, for example, in grade one, uh, children are learning about food for healthy bodies and how to understand hunger and thirst cues, um, you know, how to keep their bodies clean, what their bodies' uh, parts are, the names of their body parts. Um, those are pretty important mm-hmm. things to yeah. learn. Um, you know, I, I think this issue uh, here in Canada and in the States and in other places as well will continue to raise its head um, every time there there is an election or every time there there is a political controversy, because it's easy. You know, I think that what happens is is uh, people say, well, how do I get, you know, this group of people uh, riled up? Or how do I get that group of people riled up? I know, you know, I'll talk about sex or I'll talk about abortion or I'll talk about capital punishment. Even where the Supreme Court has come down and made dec- decisions that are more or less immutable. You know, we're not going to be revisiting capital punishment. That's not going to happen in Canada. We're we're not going to be revisiting um, same-sex marriage. That's, you know, a a hard-won right, and it's not going to change. Um, And I think that, you know, the sex sex education curriculum in Ontario was updated in 2015 after, you know, closing in on 20 years. Things change over 20 years. you know, mores change and laws change. Yeah, you, and I, I, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you mentioned there's a lot of false information out there regarding the curriculum, and, and, and you know, a lot of people haven't read it, even though they've got uh, something against it. Why do you feel that this curriculum's somewhat being subversed by false information, or, or who would be subversing it? Well, subverting it. I, I, I think that, yeah. I, um, I, you know, I, I think that anyone who sees it as beneficial to to their political uh, uh, position or their political agenda will, you know, can can use scary information. I mean, when I was talking to the families who were out protesting, some of them believed that there would be live sex demonstrations in the elementary schools. Well, that ain't happening, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and it never has. And I'm, you know, I've got mm-hmm. a, at least 50 cents uh, <laughs> that says that's never going to happen in school. But that will not happen. Um, but, you know, how do you scare parents into voting for you? Well, you say, you know, that sex education curriculum is really dangerous. And you either don't fill in the blanks or let them fill in the blanks with information that they you know, believe to be true, um, or, you know, or, or you come up with falsehoods like that one. Um, and, you know, it, it works. It, you know, if, if, if somebody says to you, you know, this candidate is going to, you know, bring this kind of uh, behavior into your child's classroom, you're going to get worried if you haven't got the either capacity or the knowledge or the ability to, to find out what the, what the facts are. Now, saying that, there are plenty of people who still object knowing what the facts are because they, they don't want any mention of sex or sexuality um, made to their children that doesn't come with their cultural context. Um, and fair enough, mm-hmm. but perhaps they can't be accommodated in a public school system. Danielle McLaughlin was the Director of Education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Education Trust, and is, she is a blogger with the Center of Free Expression at Ryerson University and joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. And, you know, with all this uh, animosity towards the curriculum and, and people uh, wanting out of it, I wonder if it's, it would set a precedent, a precedent, you know, in, in terms of, oh, well, we don't like this being taught in the school, so, okay, well, let, let's go to history now. And then, oh, well, we don't really like the way that story ends either, or that maybe that runs conflict to their either their religious or cultural backgrounds, and they, and they mm-hmm. don't want that taught either. So what's what's the next step? Well, it is a concern. I mean, fortunately, curriculum isn't set by a single person. Mm -hmm. You know, the ministry has, you know, very, well, really rather elaborate um, ways in in which uh, they they go about formulating the curriculum. But having said that, you know, the curriculum is kind of on a pendulum swing. Um, There are 
And whatever your curriculum is, there will be things included and things that you can't include or that you won't include. So will it change? Yeah, absolutely it will change. I mean, if you look at uh, history, I mean, when I when I was growing up, you know, we learned that Columbus discovered America. That was big. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then later on we learned that, you know, I can discover your front porch, but you might have a different view on that, right? So, you know, we, we learned about, you know, the indigenous peoples and about the invasion of, uh, of territories and, and our point of view changed. The facts didn't change, but how we interpret the facts change. If somebody wants to change the facts, um, my hope is they won't be able to do that, um, that, that it will, you know, that there will be enough of a democratic um, design in, in how we, we, we choose our curricula that, that the facts will remain the facts. The points, points of view will change. I, I have no doubt about that. I mean, if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their recommendations for um, education that, that indigenizes the curriculum, that's huge. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that lots of people growing up had never even heard of residential schools. They, you know, but now, you know, these facts are out and our, our kids are learning about what Canada did and, um, you know, what, what should never happen again. I think that's true about Holocaust education, which did not come in immediately after the war. It took quite a while. Um, you know, there are horrors that people do not want their children to know about because they're so dreadful. But um, these things do need to be included in the curricula. How they're included is going to be age dependent. It's also going to be dependent upon, you know, who's, who's running the government at any particular moment. What concerns do you have for young people if this curriculum is repealed? Well, firstly, I don't think it will be repealed. Um, I, I, but, uh, if it is, uh, you know, and that that's you know against you know my certainly my my hopes, I I think that it would be feeding into ignorance, um, which you know is is never good in an in an education system. I, I will note that there's also been a move to to get rid of the math curriculum, um, you know. We have different ways of teaching math, um, and we have had, you know, I don't know how many different methods of teaching math. My, my hope would be that if they, they diminish or get rid of the, the sex education curriculum, it will be a matter of finding a different way of delivering the same information. Um, but, you know, one of my worries is that, that parents will be withdrawing their, their children from classrooms where every mention of sex is made, and that will, um, you know, create um, a basically socially illiterate community. Danielle, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. Danielle McLaughlin was the Director of Education for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and Education Trust from 1988 to 2016. As well, she is a blogger with the Centre of Free Expression at Ryerson University. Ontario's Election Day is on the horizon, and personally, I can't believe this has become a key issue in the campaign this far after introduction. When I hear the shrill cry of the opposition to the curriculum, it makes me think of the Amanda Todds and the Retea Parsons of the world who were antagonized to the end and may have found the information in the curriculum helpful in dealing with her tormentors. I just wonder how many of these young people we don't know the names of who could have been helped as well. I want to thank you for listening to the Unpublished Cafe for Unpublished Ottawa. I'm Ed Hand.